Uh, welcome to a, another episode of Q&A with AgriSpray. Uh, tonight we're doing something pretty special. Um, we are joined with, I believe, the world's foremost drone and cranberry expert. Uh, Tyler, would you describe yourself as such? I, I, that's, I think that might be going a scotch too far there, Taylor. <laughs> okay, well, modest individual he is. Uh, so anyways, <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about drones and cranberries. Um, and Tyler is being modest because he is a very early adopter um, using spray drones in cranberries. Um, he's had a lot of uh, trial and error and a lot of success um, with this technology. Um, so he is here to share his wealth of knowledge um, and answer all questions that you guys might have. So if you do have questions while we are discussing tonight, feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, you can pop that up on your screen, type them in as, as we're going. We will go through questions uh, at the end as well. And uh, it's nice we have kind of a smaller group tonight. So if you have a question you want to ask out loud, you can raise your hand there at the end as well too. All right, let's get started. Um, so Tyler, um, just to start off, you mind um, kind of telling everybody um, who you are, where you live, and what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Tyler Walker uh, with Walker Cranberry, uh, right in central Wisconsin. Um, I'm a sixth generation cranberry grower, um, three generations on my farm. My grandfather started my farm back in uh, 1947. Um, I've got about 75 acres of crop in the ground. Um, and we, uh, we specialize in fresh fruit. So, um, you know, I've got a packing and a sorting facility. So all of our fruit winds up, the, the goal is to have all of our fruit wind up in a bag um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas season. Um, if there's other growers online, I mean, they, a lot of them know that there's a little different care that fresh fruit operations do than uh, some of the processed guys. Um, but yeah, we've been doing um, cranberries in my family for a long, long time. Yeah, the picture that's up is uh, the shed with the rusty roof is actually my grandfather's shed that he built back in 1952, I believe. Um, and all the beds on the right were ones that he formed up. Um, you know, we cranberries has been something in my family for a long, long time. And um, I'm the next generation hoping to try and implement some of the new technologies that's out there, which is what led me to conversations with Taylor and ultimately using the drone and why I'm here. So fair to say you uh, you grew up surrounded by cranberries all your life. Um, what made you want to stick with it? Um, just that was what you knew or what you loved or a little bit of both? Um, a bit of both. Um I, I mean, I've I've done some other. I have stepped away from uh, for a little period of time. Um, was a financial advisor, worked in an office, uh, dealt with people on a regular basis. Um, back here doing this now. There's, I don't know, something about farming, something about being in control of your own business and. Uh, that you're never doing the same thing for more than you know six weeks at a time. Uh, so even if there's a job that I don't particularly care for, like hauling pipe in the spring is probably one of my least favorite jobs. You know, I know it's only going to be for a couple of weeks and then it's over and done and we're on to the next part of the season, um, which is usually more enjoyable. You bet. So have you always uh, have you always kind of looked for new technology to bring back to the farm? Yeah, um, especially with both the, you know, the regular farm operation and then our packing house um, on the production side, uh, technology, you know, trying to implement the newest technology that we can uh, has been a really big driving force for most of my life. Um, you know, Taylor and I were talking earlier today um, about harvest and help and stuff. And it's it's harder and harder to find help as most that everybody knows that has a business these days. Um, you know, when I was a kid in the late eighties, 
we had 60 to 70 people on our payroll uh, at harvest time. It was all seasonal stuff. I mean, just a, three or four guys during the year. But then when harvest came, it was walk behind picking machines. So we had a line of 10 of those. I and mean, then we had hand sorters at our packing house. We had a room with 30 or 40 people just sorting cranberries off of tables. So it's always been a... Uh, <laughs> been a sort of a necessity because it's been harder and harder to find people that we need to find ways to implement technology. Um, for quite a while, the the major advances were on our packing house side with like optical sorters and bagging machine and automation and production. Um, but now in the last decade or two, some of the uh, automations and technology that are available out in the field have really stepped up and helped out. Yeah. So I guess, was that kind of the main driving force behind looking at, at, at the spray drone technology was kind of um, to save time or I guess, tell it, tell us about that. How you, why, why you kind of looked at spray drone technology. Um, well, I guess there's, there's a, there's a few, few layers there. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I actually was at a, um, I had a, well, I was working as a financial advisor at the time, um, and my folks had asked me to consult on some to help with the business and do some consulting to see what I thought. And um, one of the glaring issues that I saw when I was looking at the records and looking at, out at the progress in the field was um, that our IPM program um, wasn't doing its job. Our, our nutrient management and our IPM program, what they they weren't, they were costing us a lot of money because we were relying very heavily on airplanes and helicopters to put out the product. And we were miss because we were relying on somebody else to fly it on. Um, it was costing us money both in prop time and we were on somebody else's schedule. Um, a lot of my neighbors use full behind booms. Um, and at that time we, we didn't have one. So I started looking to get a new boom to pull behind, you know, the cranberry grower we use, at least around central Wisconsin, uh, pretty heavily, the, a single-sided uh, pull behind boom, um, you know, anywhere from 80, one of my neighbors has a boom that's 160 feet long, I think. Um, and I was looking just sort of, I was looking, started looking at booms and everything kept coming back at, basically $125,000 and six months wait. Um, but this would have been 2020 or so. Um, and that was the state of the business. That, was, that just wasn't something that we could just snap up that year um, because we had to modify a track. Maybe there was a lot of other costs that went into it. And so we, I knew that we had the fallback to continue using the same spraying service and maybe talk to them to try and get on a better schedule so that we could have our timings be a better, uh, more effective or we, we, where we wouldn't have to wait, you know, four or five days to put out a pesticide after we called because they weren't in our area or anything. Um, but then <laughs> I just from doing some searching and I had some familiarity with DJI products in the past, um, I found your website and your videos um, and then you and I had talked and I mean, we talked on and off for what a month or so before I finally agreed to pull the trigger. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a gamble because I couldn't find anybody else in cranberries that was doing it at that time. Um, and, um, but my, after talking with you, basically my stance was, well, it's either going to work or it's going to fail. And if it fails, I've got we're not in any worse off position than we were in. Uh, if it succeeds, we're going to be in a much better position in terms of effectiveness of our sprays and cost to us on a yearly basis. Um, and I, for that, at least for that year, there was just no way I could fit a new boom in. So it was um, partially out of necessity, partially out of luck, partially out of motivation to make some changes. Uh, I guess it was a kind of a, a combination of multiple things that that led for, to you and I having conversations. Yeah, the world's best cranberry grower meets the world's best salesman. 
<laughs> well, thing, yeah, it, I remember those conversations that that we had, uh, and I, I learned so much from you there at the beginning because you know I I know a lot about ag. You know, I grew up in in row crop, so I think I know a lot about ag, right? Everybody who, who grows up on you know planting corn and soybeans, and you know I grew up on a dairy farm, had some cattle. I think I know a lot about how things were done, um, and then I start talking to you, and you start telling me things I've management practices I've never heard of before. Um, and it, it was kind of eye opening to know that, you know, these, these drones in applications, like what you were describing to me then and what, what you've done now could be a total game changer potentially, or they could be a flop. We don't know. We don't know until you try. Right. Um, so, so glad you pulled the trigger, um, uh, on that a couple of years ago, uh, to, you know, to learn what, what you've learned and teach us what you've taught us and hopefully teach more people. So I guess um, you might, I guess, kind of talk about maybe um, what, uh, I, what what your first year was like. Um, so you got the T30 and, yep. and you know, we, we can only provide you with so much uh, information. Uh, the rest was going to be on you to kind of learn and figure it out. So what were kind of some of those learning curves that first year with the drone and cranberries? Uh, yeah, so we got, um, I mean, we, we went into it just to get, uh, we got one T30 um, just to see if if the concept was gonna work. Um, and I worked with my IPM scout and um, he admitted to me that he, I made him a little nervous when I told him what my plan was because nobody else that he scouted for in cranberries was doing it. And he knew the technology was there in row crops. He just didn't know how it was going to cross over. Um, we've, we've always sort of had, you know, we're a specialty crop and we've, we very rarely have implements and products that cleanly cross over from the general, from, from row crops into cranberries. We usually have to make, some modifications to existing stuff or build our own or design our own or whatever it might be. Um, so the first year, uh, there was definitely some experimentation that went on. Uh, there was definitely some nerves on my part because um, as my scout said so nicely, I, there, there were, because the timings were off the year before, some of the pests had had a, uh, how do you put it, a healthy population is what he, how he always liked to refer to it. So my, my priority in year one um, was pest control of using pesticides um, to try to uh, get our quality back. Um, so there was, there was a lot of experimenting early on with um, making sure I had adequate coverage. And I know I, I did rely a lot on you as you had done, uh, teamed up with the university to do all your swath with studies and stuff. Um, but one thing that we were struggling with a little bit, um, the, the cranberries, the, the vines make a pretty thick canopy that's low to the ground. Um, and, uh, initially I had to, it took a, a little bit to dial it in to get the right level of penetration to get all the way down, um, with pesticides that required contact with the, the insects. Um, but at the end of the year, the scout was, he was real pleased. I mean, there was only, there was only one spray that I had tried to alter the uh, gallons per acre. And I, I, I didn't get as effective as a, of a coverage as I should have, but all the other sprays were, were spot on. Um, then realistically, most of my year was spent trying to find the most efficient because we only had one. Um, I mean, it would take me six or seven hours to do my 75 acres. And that was, you know, from, from when I got there to start mixing chemicals to the time I was all done washing up. And I was, so I was trying to find ways to, I mean, it was 45 flights or something like that. So I was trying to find ways to, you know, knock a couple of minutes off of each flight because over the, the course of it. Um, so there was a lot of adjusting, um, patterns and moving, trying to move around my property to find the most efficient, you know, where I'd use the least amount of battery, but still 
have the greatest range. Um, so there was a lot of trial and error with that. Um, and realistically, it took most of the year before I really felt that I had a good pattern and a good system going. Um, and I was more concerned that I was actually getting adequate coverage out there. Um, and I did start using the, the drone for our fertilizer applications as well. And, um, you know, we had to change, I had changed up my nutrient management plan a little bit, um, go with a little higher uh, MPK at a little less uh, poundage per acre, just because of the, the capacity of it. But I was able to provide the plants with kind of the nutrients that they wanted on demand, as opposed to when I was using an airplane and, um, you know, we try to find the average and hit them with a larger dose of fertilizer, but we weren't going to call the airplane back every five days because we just, that just didn't make sense from a cost standpoint. So, um, they were sort of feast or famine for a while. Um, and with the drone, it was definitely a much more, it, it provided us with the flexibility to um, basically cater to our plants a lot better. Now we could have accomplished the same thing with the with a, a pull behind boom, um, but from th what I've seen out in the field for the last two years, um, it seems to do be doing exactly what I needed to, and at a quarter of the price of what a new boom would have cost me. Um, and I've been doing it all by myself. So uh, I know, again, back to some of the labor issues, most of the time it's just me out there with the drone. Sometimes my 13 year old will come out and help, you know, carry bags or do, you know, run and get fuel or whatever I need. Um, and sometimes my dad will come out and do the same thing. But um, most of the time it's me by myself. But I know quite a few of my neighbors, um, and ourselves included when we've done spraying operations in the past, you know, it takes two or three guys to be effective at it. Um, and so this was a great way for me to be productive with the man hours that I had available. Yeah. And you, so you mentioned a bit about efficiency. Um, I know some people on this right now probably already have a, um, have a drone, have used a, have used a drone at 30 or a 40, um, or have, you know, seen it in a, in a row crop scenario. Now you said, uh, about, about what, six hours for about 75 acres or, or so Is that about right. Yeah. Um, and that, and that's, that's for, for spraying pesticide, correct? Yeah. Which, so, um, depending upon the pesticide, so that I do have two pesticides that are, um, that I spray on, uh, one's called Alticor, one's called uh, Delegate. That they both require contact with, for, with whatever you know the bug. Uh, it's a fruit worm bug that they go after. That I go after with that. And um, so there's other pesticides that I use that actually will um, have a longer. They'll absorb into the plant, uh, become systemic, so that they have a longer life to them. But there's two of them that I use um, crucially in the year that. It, you have like a 48 to 72 hour window and the, the pest has to come into contact with them. So it's all about getting as much coverage and as much as you can. So with those two, what I wound up doing was flying everything twice, you know, cutting my, you know, I would still get the required, um, you know, by the label required la uh, amounts out there, but I would cut it in half and fly it twice in opposite directions, just and slightly different um, patterns just to make sure that I had no gaps and had as much penetration into the canopy as I could. So th when I have to do those, then it's, yeah, then it's like seven, um, like fertilizer, uh, you know, that's using the spreader. It's everything gets hit once. It's usually like five hours from the time I hook up to the trailer till the time I'm unhooking the trailer on 70 acres. And that's, two or three moves um, around and um, yeah, this, but that one's usually under five. My generator lasts five hours and I know I can do it on one tank of gas. So that's. 
Yeah, you got none of the signs. Sounds like. Yeah. Like, like they spend a lot of time, you know, watching screen, watching the screens, and running numbers, and trying to figure out what the best way is. Yeah. When I, you know, what what you do is very different than what we're doing here in Midwest. You know, we we'll fly a cornfield once with a drone. I mean, twice if we're doing cover crop, maybe we will full spot spray. Um, I mean, how many passes? How many passes do you do uh, in a in a season of uh, you know from pesticide to herbicide to um, to to fertilizer and and is everything done with a drone? Um, so since I the first week of June in twenty one uh, was when I picked it up, I believe. Um, we had already sprayed on two applications of one, an herbicide and a pesticide that in 21, um, because we didn't have the drone at that point, but we used a helicopter and airplane for them. Um, but since then, uh, in 21, I did five pesticide applications and six fertilizer applications with it. Um, it, last this last growing season, I did four pesticide applications and five fertilizer applications um, with it. So yeah, I mean, 10, 11 applications of chemicals a year. And it's been, uh, since we've gotten it, we have not applied, we have not had anything else put on fertilizer or um, pesticides. You know, we have one herbicide that doesn't, unfortunately doesn't have an area label at this point. So we still have to use ground techniques for that. Um, but besides that, I mean, everything else, we're careful to select stuff that has aerial application labels so that we can use it with this. But it's so, been the it's been it's been the primary workhorse. I mean, it's been the only aside from two or two two applications of uh, an herbicide. Um, it's been the only thing that's been applying pesticides um, and fertilizer to my crops for the last two years. Yeah, you know, that's impressive. That's that's something that you know we don't we don't see a lot of. You know, ten, typically, you know, in in traditional row crop or you know corn soybean um and even in a lot of other crops that we work with cotton um orchard vineyard rice uh wheat you know drones use but it's a supplement to do something that they maybe haven't been able to do um or do an application a little bit more efficient or without damaging the crop but you you've replaced every application besides one sounds like and the only reason you haven't replaced that herbicide application with the drone is because of the area label. Correct. Yeah. That's... Yeah, and um, and that's. I mean, I was just just last week kind of going over my plan for this this next year. I mean, obviously there's some things that we can't account for, but in general, I know uh, I, I know I'm going to be putting out three applications of um, pesticide and probably six applications of fertilizer so i'm just it was going through my list with my ipm got my ipm scout um so that we can you know get chemical on hand and have it ready to go for the season um and it, it, it it'll be again besides something that doesn't have an aerial label um everything will be done with drones and um yeah i mean i saw one of the in one of the questions uh, yeah, it's still, I still this last year have been using the T30. Um, I had or Taylor sent up a 40 to demo on my property. Um, and I'm going to be getting a 40 for this next year. Um, still undecided if I'm going to have a 40 and a 30 or two forties or what the deal is. But, um, one of the one of the struggles and limitations that I've had has been that um, with just one drone and nobody else really using them in the area, um, there's been a couple of computer glitches and a couple of parts uh, 
we had a gremlin that we were chasing around. We put, you sent me like three different ESCs to chase around that one. Um, but when, because I only have one, when it goes, if there is a problem, I'm waiting for somebody to get me parts because I don't have any sources anywhere close to me within driving distance. Um, so I, I mean, I already, I told Taylor this last year that I was getting a second drone of some kind this year, ideally to spray two, just to cut my time in half. Um, but just to make sure that I'm always at least spraying one, because, you know, if there's, if there's pests out there, <laughs> waiting a few days can, can really cause an impact as any farmer knows. So. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, we might, we might start getting into some of these questions here, but, uh, before I do, while we're on this, uh, this picture of your trailer, um, you mind just kind of walking through? I mean, because you you put this together yourself. Um, mind walking yeah, through is, kind of how it's all designed? I kind of see a, a boom sticking out there, and uh, yeah. So, so guess, so this is uh, this is version two point oh. Um, version three point oh has not come out yet, but this is uh, this was the, the the second redesign. Um, so obviously elevated platform. Um. Thankfully, one thing that's great great for drones and cranberries is that uh, we're flatland farmers. I mean, we make the we make our fields flat. There aren't any obstructions, any you know that I have to worry about. And we segment off our fields um, with roads around them that make really great landing sites. So I just basically have to I can pull up next to roads and be able to land next to the trailer. Um, but I do have the option to take off from the the elevated platform. Uh, um, the water tank that's up front is my chemical mix tank. Um, it's got an agitator in the bottom. Uh, most of my chemicals that I deal with are uh, dissolvable in water, uh, in powder solutions that are dissolvable in water. So I have to mix them um, up in a tank to get them into a liquid form. Now, the boom that you see, um, this was, <laughs> it's still on there. Um, this is the first attempt. So uh, there's a pallet of fertilizer bags. It's 50 or 50 pound bags of triple uh, 17, I believe is what we've got, 17, 17, 17. Um, and what I, what we learned in year one of using the spreader with fertilizer, um, if you had any clump, we did, we did run into a couple of issues where if there was some clumping in the fertilizer, there was, there's an error that can occur if the gate close, if the uh, spreader gate closes on a clump, it will recognize that error, but it will maintain flight. It just won't be spreading. It won't try and open or clear it or do anything. Um, and yeah, that caught me by surprise once or twice in their first year. Um, the only fix is to start digging around and pop the bottom of the thing off and you're trying to deal with getting the gate clean while it's full of fertilizer. Um, so that boom, it's, it's got a hoist and a cable um, that's attached to that blue uh, bucket. I mean, it's not a bucket, but it's uh, a hopper. And on top of that hopper, there's a, a expanded metal screens. So when I, instead of dumping the bags directly into the drone, I can fill up that hopper and it'll go through a screen uh, yeah, there's me, of course, dumping it directly into the drone. But um, yeah, there you go. Now you can see it. So that uh, that hopper will hold uh, 100 and, 150 pounds I can fit in there. And it all passes through a screen. So I get rid of any clumps or get them broken up. So that way um, I don't have to worry about it causing an issue inside the spreader um, when it's, you know, it was the only real issue we had was clumps that would get either caught up but would get caught up in the gate and you know when you think about the likelihood that it's actually going to be closing at the same time as a clump is it's, it's not great but when it does happen it can really uh, because it's not a it's not an error that causes it to stop flying and return home or stop and hover it just keeps flying it's just the gates no longer opening or shutting or doing anything um so we we fought, tried to find a way to Fix, alleviate that. Um, additionally, we were trying to find, I mean, it's 
if the fertilizer isn't clumpy or anything, it's not terrible to dump the bag directly into um, the top, but it is a little clunky. You know, the arms are sticking out there. You're trying to dump a bag into the hopper. Um, there definitely was some spillage and some um, wasn't always the cleanest that uh, we were trying to find a more efficient way to keep it. Um, and the other thing was I was able to put a uh, scale on the hook. Um, I don't think it was in those pictures, but that way I could actually pre-measure my amount of fertilizer that I knew I was going to be putting out into the next um, field. Yeah, it's not on that one. Um, but so that way, you know, they're 50 pound bags and otherwise you have to sit there and go off of what the scale on the remote says, which we still did, but we could have it, you know, plus or minus a couple of pounds just by preloading it into the hopper. Um, and that way, you know, it's just a, a, a simple valve or a simple latch on the bottom so that it can come out. Um, again, just, just about trying to find the most efficient ways to keep things going. Um, the other, well, I guess while we're on it, uh, the other um, thing that is not shown on the trailer here, but with, with the fertilizer spreading with a spreader, um, I do carry around an air compressor because the spinner with the fertilizer will start to release moisture throughout the day. So once every hour, I try to take an air, uh, some compressed air just to clean off the spinner mechanism itself because it's the, the moisture releasing from the fertilizer and the spinner is kind of crushing some of the fertilizer it makes a really lovely paste of dust um, that can cause the spinner to not always spin or um, is really a nasty mess to clean up if you wait till the end. So it's better to stay ahead of it. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, other than that, it's behind that water, I mean, back to the trailer, the behind that water tank, I have my generator um, for when I'm doing liquid sprays. That's just a, you know, it's a, a pump that we can see the clear tubing wrapped around. Um, with a gas nozzle on the end so that it's easy for um, filling. Um, I, most of everything else, I, I mean, I know that the, the boom with the hopper on it um, is something that uh, I haven't really seen because, I mean, I do rely on this for a lot of granular applications. So we were trying to figure out what the best way for that is. Um, but most of the other stuff is probably, I think it's pretty similar to one of your previous trailers i mean it was the setup yeah, yeah real similar and yeah i mean it makes sense you know you you do way more fertilizer work than pretty much anybody else uh that we work with you know besides a couple other uh, cranberry guys really um so yeah it's uh so this this was your your second you know, version two here so you learned a lot from version one sounds like <laughs> yeah well and we're still the boom, um, I believe it is 10 and a half feet long. So that's where the, when it swings out, you know, the drone is about 10 and a half. The fill is about 10 and a half feet. Um, it's right on the edge of where the radar doesn't like it sticking up there. I mean, if I could get another two feet away, um, but playing with the laws of physics a little bit where you start leveraging a boom out with 100 pounds on it every six inches you go i mean it's the um it's already in a custom um cylinder that we welded to the trailer and uh, yeah it's um <laughs> well you know but, what's ironic about this tyler you know you got a drone to get away from single-sided booms to spray your cranberries and here you yeah. are building a single sided build, boom build, with the counter here, here, here I'm trying to trying to build a boom to make my my drone work yes <laughs> yeah that's great uh all right we're going to get into a, a few questions here um and this one's you know if we get this one a lot you know how how windy from Corey here how windy can it be before it's too windy to fly and you know, I, I know we have our recommendation, you know, the, the drone says 15 miles an hour and and the uh, uh, pesticide label will say something. Um, but, you know, for us, you know, whenever we can move maybe our application one day or the other day, 
um, you know, that's, it's not that big a deal, but for you, you're making you know, multiple applications throughout the year. So do you have problems with wind up there? Do you have to work around that? Um, so I have a 15 knot wind sock um, on the, uh, on one of my outbuildings. So when it's, when it's completely straight, I know the wind is 15 knots. Um, if it's completely straight, that means all flights are, are, are done. Um, I will, I'll go pretty darn close to it with granular because I've, um, it doesn't see, it doesn't seem to be having a drift. I mean, I fly at 15 feet. Um, I can see the cone. I can see how it gets affected. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of drift from it. So essentially the wind becomes more of a factor that the drone is struggling, especially, you know, especially if I've got 75 pounds of fertilizer in there and it's trying to maintain in a 15, uh, 15 knot crosswind. Um, most of the liquid sprays, um, most of the labels are cut you off at 10 miles an hour. And uh, typically by the time it gets to eight to 10, you know, you can start to see the drift in it. Um, I've got no issue, you know, five to eight. Um, you might you might start seeing a little bit of a drift, but you can kind of once you start seeing it, you can I can offset a little bit to cut. But um, the stuff that does drift is very minimal. Um, but no, I'm, most of pretty much all of my uh, liquids are cap the the label caps me at at ten, and you know that's sort of always rule number one is you have to stick to whatever the label caps you at and. Yeah, um, I it probably could go, but you would be winding up probably offsetting yourself by a half a swath just to overcome the. Um, but I mean, typically, what it mean there's there's very few there's very few chemicals that really overlap for me, which is uh, is nice. Um, you know, pesticides. There's a couple in the sp in the summer that do overlap with fertilizer. But I will, I basically, I will prioritize a pesticide over a fertilizer, you know, because I can fly in higher wind. And if I have to bump fertilizer from today till tomorrow, it's not as big of a deal as if I bump a pesticide from today till tomorrow. Um, so it's a lot of, I mean, typically when I spray, I, I, I mean, it's, this has sort of always been the case when, whenever we've sprayed you plan on going out and being spraying by first light just because it's going to be the calmest and you go until the wind shuts you down and I'll shut down and I'll come back, you know, six, seven o'clock at night when it starts to get calm again and go until, you know, it's dark. And usually the mosquitoes drive me away by then. So then I just, if I have more to do, I'll come back the next morning and finish up. But most applications that I have between a morning and an evening, I can get done. And so if I have to wait out the wind, that's what I'll do, but. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, so very rarely shut down with, with wind, it sounds like, yeah. yeah. And th this kind of leads into the nozzle question, um, you know, the T30, um, if you guys on the, on the, you know, are watching this right now and you're not familiar, uh, the T30 uses T-Jet nozzles, um, has 16 of them, it'll spray 12 at a time. And you can, of course, change out those nozzles for different droplet sizes and everything. Uh, the T40, which is kind of the flagship right now, uses centrifugal uh, atomizer where you can adjust your nozzle uh, or your, your atomization your droplet size uh, by just um, adjusting the speed of that nozzle. But with the T30, um, did you try out different nozzles? Um, and what did you settle on? Uh, we... We only tried the two different sizes that it, we were originally equipped with. The, the we 01 with, and the 02. Yeah, and we yeah. went with the, sm the smaller one. Most of most of the chemicals that I spray, they're looking for the smallest droplet size possible. Um, I wanted to see if there, was, there wasn't really a noticeable difference between the one and the two when we swapped them around. Um, but I like... I, you know, it didn't seem like it was combating wind any differently. It didn't seem, um, 
too terribly, but that was all just from visual from the road. So I, we just went with the smaller one thinking, you know, planning to get as fine of a droplet as we could. That way the prop, you know, would help really get us a nice swath width um, and try and get as much penetration with a smaller particle as we, as we could. Right. Um, I, I, did, I mean, there wasn't any, I didn't run across anything that caused clogging. Like, there was no chemical that I ran across that caused clogging while spraying. Um, you know, the I put it to the I put it through its paces this last year. Um, first time I ever ever sprayed one, this one one product for a new bug that we'd never had before. Um, so that was that was a fun treat. But that's according to the label, I could do two gallons per acre from the air, um, and it was a four pound per, per acre mix. So I had four pounds of powdered solution in two gallons of water. Um, it was, you know, that was asking a lot and I didn't clog up. I mean, I was pretty diligent about checking because I was worried that I was going to get a clump or do something, but that was, uh, I didn't have any, the only time I ever had clogging issues is if I didn't take the time to clean the nozzles properly at the end. You know, when I started up the next time, there would be a little dried chemical or dried something that needed to get scrubbed out. Sure. That's good to know. Um, yeah. so, so the only gonna... clogging issues, basically, the only clogging issues were my own fault and yeah. not the drone's <laughs> fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good deal. That that that, and that was an issue with the T thirty. I mean, you've got sixteen nozzles there, and each each set of nozzles has, um, you know, a, a, a solenoid and small lines. And so, yeah, if you are running small nozzles, then and especially if you don't rinse out, I assume you probably, you know, we're pretty diligent about rinsing out at the end of yeah. every day. You, I mean, you got, you got to make sure you rinse out. Um, I actually found that crud cutter, like a home siding cleaner, did a really nice job of cleaning the lines. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, minimum, but I mean, after, after the one, the first time that I uh, had some clogging issues that uh, they were my own fault. Um, I made sure that at the end of every day of spraying, I ran at least three full tanks of just straight clean water through to flush and try and dilute everything out. Um, and I started at the end of every day taking all of the nozzles off and soaking them in a, you know, like a beaker of um, water with a little soap. Just to, and I, even if it was late at night, to throw them in there and the next morning I'd come and make sure that I scrubbed them and that they were all good. But um, most of the chemical, if you let it, if you let it dry, it's, it's no fun. Yeah. And this is one thing that, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're probably looking forward to anyways, but the, uh, the 40 is two nozzles instead of 16, uh, yes. that don't have tiny orifices. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, and that, that's what I think, you know, in your situation where you're doing higher volumes, you know, first off, of course, a bigger drone that has a higher discharge. Uh, rate is going to speed up your efficiency, uh, but also just the cleanup time sounds like you were putting a lot of time at the end of the day into just making sure everything was clean and ready to go for next time. Should be the cut down a bit on the 40. That, that would be appreciated. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's still easier to clean than a lot of stuff I've dealt with in the past, but um, yeah, the, 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 there was one time where I, I did not do a good job. It, it was the first year um, because it was so easy to clean. I thought I, I had flown it a few times and uh, cleaned it pretty well. And I, every time I came back, it was working just fine. I'm like, well, maybe I'm actually doing more than I need to. And then, um, yeah, that I learned I wasn't like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and if I didn't do it, that yeah, you'd clog clog all the way down. Um, yeah. There you go. And we've, uh, with the 40, we've, we've used it for while well, spraying paint on greenhouses and, and whatnot. And, um, and we're testing out a product, uh, painting a temporary paint on Turkey barns. And that's, you know, it's like, we're yeah, off that that'll be coming. Don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, more to come on that. But, uh, you know, that's pretty, it gets pretty thick, of course, you know, and it can't sit there very long 
in the system before, you know, it kind of starts to, you know, get real thick. And yeah, the 40, if we ever had a problem, all we had to do was take off the, the, just the one disc on the boom that was, that was clogged, take it off, you know, that would kind of relieve some of the pressure, turn the sprayer on, and then it would just push that clog out and away we went. So yeah, that'll be nice for you. Yeah. Well, and actually since the, this picture is up right now, um, there's one other uh, minor change in the 40 that I think will have a huge, well, I know it'll have a, a big effect because you guys have already tested it and it's already proven that it has. Um, with use with using the spreader on the 30, uh, that bottom cross member um, does like to deflect material back up into the props. So, I mean, the shields are on, um, the, ex the extenders that came with it are on, but the, those, the way that those cross members are in there, they'll hit and bounce up into the props and uh, they, they will slowly chew the props. And with the 40, just a basically a simple little redesign of how the, and the radar is on top. And so there's no bars to hold the radar underneath it. And that little curve that goes up, there isn't, there isn't anything that will deflect the uh, <clears throat> media that you're spreading back up into the props. So yeah, I, I never had any, any strikes, any bird strikes, any collisions with the building, collisions with power lines, anything like that. But I've still gone through three or four sets of props on mine just from the fertilizer bouncing up into the props. Yeah. You know, that's where, yeah, some guys we talk to that, that do not probably as much spreading as, as you're doing with, with the 30. They'll they'll keep a set of props just for spreading and a set yeah. of props for spreading. That's, that's exactly what I had to I just I had one set that I would, I mean, if I was really in a rush, I wouldn't change them. But if, if if I had 20 minutes, I'd sit there and make sure that I changed the props depending upon what I was spraying. So, yeah. So we, we've talked a lot about kind of the, the economics and how, you know, the operating, you know, on your trailer and all, all that kind of stuff. And, but, you know, I guess one thing, and you talked a bit about kind of some of the manpower requirements, which I'm sure a drone's going to cut down on, on costs there. But, you know, Joe has a question here just about ROI in general. Um, I don't know if you've done any math. I mean, you talked about saving money on fertilizer a little bit, um, but. My, my, my ROI on, um... So my 30 plus the training, plus the licensing, plus the initial trailer, plus I, I was right around 40 grand all in. Um, and my bill for prop time the year prior uh, was $34,000 to my local contractor for spraying. And I went through about 15% less product because the because my cranberry fields are set up in you know anywhere from two to five acre rectangles the airplane comes by and it would drop the it would fly its most efficient path which usually meant that it was dropping its um the fertilizer my roads were very well fertilized my, my grassy roads were very well fertilized um but because I was able to actually direct it all in the area, um, I, I ordered the exact same amount of fertilizer and put out the exact same amount of nitrogen as I did the year before per acre. But I was about 50, I had about 10 to 15% left over a surplus at the end of the year. And that translated through all. Um, so I'm very comfortable saying I had a one year ROI on it, um, just keeping it on my own property um, just replacing what I was doing. Yeah. On 75 acres. That's, yeah, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, now, I mean, obviously I, I don't factor my time into it. I, you know, my time is like any other farmer, our time is supposed to be out in the field anyway, but, um, what else would you do anyways? Yeah. Right. Yeah, what, 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 what else would I be doing anyways? That's that's exactly it. what else would I be doing anyways? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now the focus has, or, you know, 
I know that I, there's probably some other factors that go into it that actually are a little better even because I have, um, I have power lines on one side of my, one section of fields um, and the crop testers, I absolutely don't blame them. They, they pulled up early, but, you know, give the power lines plenty of room. So there was definitely some sections of my fields that um, didn't always have the greatest coverage. And, you know, that turnaround was pretty quick because the drone could get into those corners and into those areas and it wasn't bothered by anything. Um, but flying an airplane around, yeah, I, I, I would have pulled up way sooner than those guys did. Um, so I did see some increased productivity in my crops and in my fields in, in areas that have normally been lacking um, because they haven't been hit properly by uh, our previous spring. Uh, so some of those little things, I don't, I don't fully know how to put into a formula to figure out like if it, but I just know that there are definitely areas that were weak that are now more uniform with the rest of my fields. So. That's awesome. So you're talking about, you, you think, I mean, you got savings and not, you know, your ROI basically came from uh, not having to pay somebody numbers. Number one yeah. savings on, on product, you know, I guess more uh, accurate application, less off target application. And then the last thing there was, it sounds like more even application or being able to, to take care of that, those areas that need to, need to be taken care of. Yeah. I mean, um, there was, um, I can think of one, one section that's right along power lines and another, another section that um, has got one or two trees that pilots like to avoid. Um, and they've always been, a little weak now we it, it, with the cranberries it's hard to tell with the way we harvest it's hard to like tell was we don't we're not scaling it by you know the square foot if we harvest the whole bed we can tell that corners are weak when we see the fruit coming off the vine but the way we take it off the bed it's not like we know specifically what that corner like what that corner was compared to the rest of the bed um so that's why i don't quite know how to scale it i just know that the last two years, when it comes to harvest time, the, the amount of weak spots, the, 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 the normal weak spots where the fruit was always a little lighter, they're just, they're more even now. So it's, um, I credit it to the fact that they're actually getting the same type of coverage as what the rest of the fields were. Um, they were just in tricky spots that, you know, airplanes and helicopters had a hard time getting to. So yeah. Yeah. And, you know, once something here that kind of goes along with that is maintenance. I know you, you use the drone a lot. I mean, you talked about obviously props, right? Uh, props. And then there was an ESC issue that we kind of tracked down. It was notorious. T30 was kind of notorious for that ESC issue. Other than those two things, props, ESC, uh, what other maintenance, you know, issues have you had with, with, with the T30? Um, towards the end of this last year, my, um, gauge in my liquid tank seemed to be getting stuck in a spot. So it would start, you know, I'd read seven gallons and it would go down and all of a sudden at around two and a half gallons left, it just like froze there. And then all of a sudden it would jump. Now I knew my properties. I knew what I was spraying. I knew how much I needed in. It wasn't really a factor for me to, that prevented me from spraying because I knew that the gauge was working on the top end. So like when I filled it up to fly, to fly two acres, I made sure I had enough product in there that, and I trusted because I'd used it enough that um, I knew it was going to do it. So I knew even if the gauge was sticking somewhere around two and a half gallons, that it had enough product to make it to the end and that it was going to fly its route just fine. Um, and then I had to replace, and this was a quality control issue, the uh, GPS module up on top, I believe it was. Uh, anyway, you, you told me a couple of, when I had reached out to your service department, they told me a couple of things to check. And when I pulled off one of the modules, the uh, O-ring was missing underneath it. 
so some moisture had gotten into that module and there was a, some slight corrosion. Um, and that was, I think the props that ESC Gremlin the first year, which we got resolved. Um, there was an update, what was that? I think that was a full year ago. There was an update that was causing some pairing issues, but you guys were on top of that and you just had to load a previous version. Um, it was all software. I mean, it wasn't any hardware. I remember that was that was a fun one, um, but it was a simple fix right on the spot. Uh, I think really that's about, that seems to be about, I've had, I've had one battery that um, started causing me some issues this year. Um, the other two were fine for two years. Um, you know, so I replaced one battery, but for the hours and then the amount of applications, I guess, that I did on my farm, I thought that was pretty good. I mean, they, they're charging and discharging a lot. So, so slightly less maintenance than overhauling your old Ford. Slightly less than <laughs> overhauling the old Ford. Yes. <laughs> yes. That, that, that's so far. It's the cheapest piece of cheapest maintenance on the piece of equipment that I've got. So, yeah. Yeah. You bet. And we have a few questions in here that are kind of off the cranberry subject. And uh, so we'll probably just stick to the cranberry uh, subject on these. If you guys have questions outside of that, then you kind of reach out to us. Um, otherwise, um, uh, we've curio curiosity here to see if you know any of the growers in Oregon, Tyler. When I was a young fella, I did. Um, and I don't, my, uh, my dad was involved with some of the boards and some of the committees that um, he was. He did a lot of work with growers in Oregon back then, and but I I don't personally know any of them anymore that I that I can that I can recall. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. And I know we've got uh, we have another uh, drone guy I mean, on oh, on I, here. I, mean, I, I see the anonymous attendee. Um, down there. Okay. Um, so yeah, they manage, so Oregon manages, um, pretty similar. Um, they don't, uh, they don't always have to worry about the harsh, the same type of harsh cold winters that we do. I think most of, most of the growers in Oregon are closer to the coast that don't get the necessarily, you know, negative 20 degrees that we had last week. But, um, i believe most of the growers in Oregon uh, manage very similar to what the people in Wisconsin do. Um, you know, same uses of water and wet floods. Um, I know East Coast, some uh, are able to um, use controlled floods the same. Some, um, because of the layouts have and regulations, have a harder time, so they do a lot more stuff dry. Right. I know we have a another uh, cranberry guy up, up on here, and I've talked to him, and he was, you know, he says he they do a lot more dry application as well. Um, and he actually just asked a question here. So he's run a T thirty in cranberries too. Um, Dave is asking what what speed do you travel at uh, for liquid application? Uh, so liquid application, um, I put it at. I spray it to two gallons per acre because that's the max speed for the 30, which I believe is tw uh, 20 feet per second. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's like 23, but yes, same thing. 20, 20, 23 maybe. Yeah, that's maybe. T yeah, but I know uh, anything over two gallons, if you, when you're applying anything over two gallons per acre at a rate, uh, then it starts to comp uh, compensate by slowing it down. So, I did try applications. Usually, I target four get like with my most of my liquids. I target uh, four gallons per acre as my solution that I put out there, which is equivalent to what helicopters are doing most of the time. Um, so that was the number I was comfortable with. Um, so if I fly it at two gallons an acre twice for some of those applications, 
it actually flies faster than once at four gallons to the acre because the machine's moving quicker and can, um, I, it's only a matter of seconds, but again, when I was doing some, some of the experimenting that first year, I know that uh, flying it twice, I was done in whatever, six hours, and then the, doing it the one time at four gallons per acre, it was like six and a half hours. So over the course of the day, it was about, I picked up an extra 30 minutes somewhere. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I guess what... Um... The, the, well, the, is the 40... The 40 flies more consistently at like 28 to 29, doesn't it? So, yeah, the, the 40 can fly. Um, you can put on, I believe, 2.5 gallons per acre at full speed, which is uh, 32.8 feet per second. Now, well, okay, that's if you're utilizing like your 32 foot uh, uh, route spacing. But um, if you're flying a bit lower uh, to the canopy and uh, putting on higher volume, and you slow down a, a, a bit, of course, your route spacing swap width is a bit is narrower, of course. Um, but yeah, you can you can fly about 30% faster with, with the 40, and your your discharge rate is close to double, I believe, or just about double. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Or more time to ride your dirt bike next year. I think Tyler's what that means. <laughs> well, you know, by next year, then it'll, my son will be back here. So then I, he won't let me play with it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess we'll look through here, make sure I didn't, didn't miss a whole lot here. Uh, uh, Yanni asked something. He ditched, but he did ask something in the middle there. Okay. Oh yeah, I, part of I love canopy. You talked about speed, I guess, since we're going on the same trajectory here. Um, yeah, what swath width did you run with the with the T thirty? And uh, uh, so I was banking on a, I was assuming a twenty eight foot swath width, um, and I would average about eight and a half feet for liquid, um, and you know, some of it was, you know, best fit to field. So I, I wouldn't redraw my fields until I got, I mean, I was comfortable with most of the stuff with a little bit of overlap. Um, so I wouldn't redraw a lot of my fields unless I was basically below 26 feet for swath width or over 30 feet for swath width. So that was, I was shooting for 28, but realistically anything 26 to 29 was, I was comfortable with at eight and a half feet. Um, with the sprayer, no, with the spreader, that one, uh, I did 30 foot swath width at 15 feet. And that was just what I set everything to. Um, because I was using it for fertilizer, one thing I did is I had two sets of maps for all my fields, um, with these boundaries. Um, one was right to the boundary and one was sucked in so that I would be about 10 feet off from my line. So I go through everything, do it on, you know, granular map one, and then the next application would be granular map two. So that way I knew that each application of fertilizer wasn't directly over, you know, so if there was a little spot that got missed, I wouldn't have streaking or striping. Um, so yeah, that was one way that I took that. Yeah, sure. What, so I guess kind of maybe, uh, um, well, before I ask this question, I do have another question, I guess, um, you know, you're, you're kind of a early adopter and whatnot. And, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, we're, we're looking at spot spraying, uh, and some variable rate application, uh, with these drones, there's software now, you know, PIX4D, Agrimo, um, and a few other ones, uh, that are getting pretty good, pretty easy to use, um, and with the, the Mavic multispectral, um, you know, crop health analysis um, is just getting faster and easier. Are you looking at any of that technology uh, if, for for managing managing your cranberries? Um, so I'm going to be exploring some of the spot treatments 
that I, uh, I have available to me this, uh, this upcoming year. Um, I have some, uh, some spots of weeds that I'd like to target. They haven't been high priority because they're not impacting my crop. They just, they're still just weeds I'd like to manage and maybe before they get out of control. Um, so I'm going to be exploring that. Um, I mean, I, I haven't, uh, some of the other, the infrared technology, um, some of the other cameras that I know have been very successful in uh, row crops, haven't quite found the same success in cranberries because by the time, uh, I mean, most fun, uh, fungicides, at least in Wisconsin, aren't super huge. Um, I mean, we, we, a lot of growers usually have one or two. I know the East Coast struggles with it a little bit more, but um, those are put on your, your application timing is so different. Um, you know, where most fungicides are put on like during bloom and you might not see the effects of that fungus until the fruit actually forms a few weeks later. So you um, can't rely on that. And even some of the data that I've seen for um, like pest hotspots and stuff, um, by the time the cameras are able to tell a difference um, in, in, in whatever the spectrum that they're using, basically you've already missed your prime window to spray. Um, and you, I mean, it's still gonna, you still gotta get out there and spray, but you should have been, you should have sprayed before you got to that point to minimize that damage. Um, so no one's, no one's really experimenting too much with it yet because it just, we can't, haven't seemed to find anything, at least that I know, maybe people are out there that are, um, but you know, a lot of times it's growers doing their own experimenting and there's only so far you're really willing to risk your stuff before you're just going to be like, no, I'm, I'm going to go take care of that. Um, I do, I mean, uh, uh, Taylor and I have talked about before. Um, I do use a, I just actually got one to use this year. Um, it's from FJ Dynamics who um, DJI, I think it's a couple of their engineers that went and started this FJ Dynamics and DJI heavily invested in them to get them started. Um, they make uh, auto steers for tractors, but they also have this um, Rover uh, RTK GPS so you can go out and plot points um, RTK points and make them your own shape files uh, really easily and effectively. So I'm going to use that to redraw my maps with um, some new shape files using this survey tool. Um, I'm, I have noticed, you know, without using RTK so far, I have noticed some GPS drift that occurs with my drone. Um, so I'm looking to improve on that. That would be, that would be pretty stellar. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you're sounds like from a, from a scouting perspective that that's, that's boots on the ground eyes in the crops. That's the best yeah. way for, yeah. And I, I don't, I don't disagree one, one bit with that, especially. You know, you know, I, I do have, uh, I do have a friend of mine and I, he just finished his first year. He, um, he's got a drone with a, amazing camera and his goal so it's a, a vertical takeoff but it's a fixed wing drone yeah. um with an amazing camera with amazing resolution and his goal was to fly it once a week all growing season to see if he could um i mean i think it, i think he had something like a two centimeter pixelation off the can off the camera I mean, it was so he was actually able to see in pretty great detail um but he was going to try and compile and layer those images to see if he could, I mean, he still did boots on the ground, but he wants to see if he could correlate what yeah. he saw from the air to what he was seeing on the ground, to see if there's any predictors that he could have been out there earlier. Um, but so far, all, all of our scouting efforts are very much, I mean, it's, they're, it's weekly scouts, sometimes twice weekly, if there's a time when we're concerned, but um, weekly scouts of a third of our acreage, and traps and you know the standby you know the, the old tried and true methods to make sure that we're on top of stuff yeah 
Well, and you know, I guess that what, what I I guess hadn't didn't think about it until just now. You know, when we're doing mapping and you know on cornfields, we're talking. You know, we got to do thousands of acres. Um, so we, we fly at 400 feet or 200 feet well, with the scouting drone to cover a wider area. But with you guys, you know, 70 acres with an M3M, even at 50 feet altitude, that would not take that long. And you would get really a high definition picture. Um, so that's so, probably so a good idea. Just, yeah, just so that's the, 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 the mini three then? That's, uh, that's the Mavic, Mavic 3M. So yeah, just on the left side of the screen here, uh, there's the... The Mavic 3 Multispectral M3M, and then there's okay. a Mavic 3 Thermal M3T. Uh, the Multispectral, that's got four cameras, uh, plus your regular RGB camera uh, for regular imagery. Uh, but the four sensor, four cameras, that's for your spectral analysis. Uh, so it does, you know, uh, it, you can, it can see more than, than, than the human eye, essentially, uh, yeah. can. And there's not a lot of good you know software to kind of take that analysis and tell you exactly what you know is going on with your plants just yet but there's software coming you know so having that data that bank of data um yeah no yeah. I, and well so i know my son runs a little dji mini two i think is what generation he's got and he cruises i mean he likes to cruise over me when i'm spraying just to and, but yeah, he can he can cruise the whole property pretty quickly. So, which I think the specs for those minis are about the same as the Mavics. And um, as far as I mean, probably slightly slower if you're trying to take good pictures and stuff. But um, it probably won't take long to utilize one of those on my property. Um, I don't. I mean, I I'm definitely not opposed to exploring that option. It's um, I just I know we haven't seen the camera tech that has been suitable and i don't know if it's the camera or the software um but a bit I'm of sure, both I mean, yeah it, a bit it's, of both. it's sort of inevitable that at some point it will be here and be ready um so maybe it is now i don't know yeah possibly it's it's as ready as as it's ever been i'll put it that way it's it's <laughs> to the point where i am finally excited about it you know back when we we started um just on the, on the spray drone side I wasn't excited about camera drones. They were oversold. Um, I wasn't excited about software. It was underpowered. Um, and even like the DJI had a um, you know, pretty affordable multispectral, the Phantom 4 multispectral uh, back then. But unless you were a, a researcher or university, it wasn't really that valuable of information. It was too costly. And the software wasn't there to make it easy. But now with the Mavic 3 multispectral, yeah, maybe the information right now is not quite useful just because we still need more information, more software about, you know, to analyze multispectral, but it's affordable. It's super fast, long battery life, great camera on it. It's the most, I mean, it's the best multispectral drone, drone you can get, especially for the money. And then with programs like Pix4D, you know, Pix4D has, has some new, um, some new uh, version out now that works directly with the DJI system, the, the T40, T20P, uh, for creating spot spraying, variable rate, uh, mapping, all that stuff uh, right on there um, and works directly with the M3M for importing that. You can do it all, you can do it all in the field and same within the same hour, basically. Uh, so that's the cool part. You don't have to wait, essentially. It's all same day turnaround time. Um, so that's, that's why we're finally excited and we're finally we 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 just became distributor for for pix 4d uh i don't, I don't t tend to do that unless i believe in something so um it, it, i think it, it we're as ready as we've ever been to adopt this technology but again if you need to do your, your research to figure out what you're going to use it for yeah well, um yeah. so i guess one question here um just again about about your 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 operation, and then I'll have to follow a, a wrap up question. Um, your generator, what size is that that you're using? Uh it's the one that you had recommended at the training day, the Westinghouse. The Westinghouse ninety five hundred. Ninety five hundred, yeah. I, I think we've helped make that company millions of dollars off of, <laughs> off of Westinghouse <laughs> generators. <laughs> That's what everybody's got. 
Yeah, yeah I mean, it just cheap. It's yeah, cheap you, and it works. <laughs> it, it 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 has uh, the only issue that I ever had with it was it's got a switch to go from gas to LP on it, and it wasn't quite closed all the or it wasn't quite all the way to gas, so it kept having like a kind of a fuel line issue. I just gave it a little twist, and I was like, "Yeah, it wasn't." Somebody bumped it when they walked past it. That was it. Um, but it has it fires up every time. It hasn't had any power issues. Power. I mean, it's been it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Yeah, you bet. And then, yeah, I don't know who asked that question, but when it gets a T forty, it'll be the same charger um, and same generator setup. I would imagine T uh, forty does draw a bit more power potentially. Um, so your battery to charge ratio might be a bit different, but for what you're doing, I don't think it'd be any different. Um, all right. Um, uh, wrap up question here, Tyler. Um, you know, you are, you've, you've been on the, the leading edge of this technology, um, and it's worked for you. Right. Um, uh, and so it's a matter of time, you know, especially with, you know, with, with, you know, you helping us educate this industry before people, you know, follow your footsteps. So what, if, if somebody's getting their first ever drone and it's a, it's a spray drone for their cranberry operation, uh, any small piece of advice you can, you can leave them with. It's going to work. I mean, <laughs> that's, that, that I, I was nervous because I couldn't find other people that were doing it. I mean, I called you and you were, you know, are you the expert in drones and row crops? And you even admit, I, I don't, I don't know about cramp. It should work. It should work and it should be effective. Uh, but nobody's really doing it yet. And I mean, somebody's got to be the first. Um, my IPM scout, you know, he didn't tell me until the end of the year. He's like, I was really nervous when you told me what your plan was. And that's why I wanted to make sure I was here all the time. And I told him, like, I may have portrayed myself as confident, but I was nervous that it wasn't going to work, too. Um, uh, you know, there's always some nerves that go into trying something so drastically new. Um, you know, other other growers, have, lots of other growers have approached me in this area. And, you know, I'm not telling anyone who's got a boom to go out and sell their boom and go buy a drone right now. Um, but I, I think that you'd be surprised with how similar of coverage you're going to get and how much less work it's going to be. And you can save the life of your boom and always have your boom as a backup. Um, you know, if you're spending good chunks of money on helicopters and airplanes, um, then you should, I mean, if that's something that you're looking at, that's there's definitely an ROI on it when it's compared to prop time. I mean, the last I knew my prop time was like $2,200 an hour for a helicopter and $1,850 for an airplane. And that was what, it, I mean, it adds up quick. Um, I don't, I mean, it's, I don't have any overall advice for first time, but besides that it, it, it will work. You just might have to figure out your own property a little bit differently than some of the, you know, everyone knows their own property. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how you can save 30 seconds per flight, you know, just because in the end that might save you a half an hour or an hour or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess if you're anything like me, that's what you'll spend your first year doing is first it was, all right, how can we save, you know, two minutes per flight? And then it was, about one minute and then it was 30 seconds and not down to like, how can we make each flight 10 seconds quicker? Like we have to move to a better spot. Like it's just the simple with, solution. Simple session. solution is buy 40 or buy two and then you'll save yourself all <laughs> kinds of time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You bet. Well, and, and the good thing now too is, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm sure cranberry, you know, farms range in, in acreage and size. Um, and the good thing now is this technology is scalable. Um, you don't, it's not one option. 
I know there's there's the the 40, which 140 is going to be great for your operation. Tyler, two is going to be you know even more efficient and redundant. Um, and then if you were running a smaller operation, there's the T20, um, which is the same exact drone, just half the size um, and costs less. Um, so there there is a drone for each operation. Um, to make that ROI, you know, even quicker. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I've had, I mean, I'm 75 acres is somewhere around our state average, actually. I mean, some of the big, some of the biggest ones are, you know, 1500 acres. Um, I'm, I've got a neighbor on one side who's 40 acres, another neighbor that's 70 acres and another one that's 230 in plant. I mean, uh, and those are the ones that are strong. Me, the ones that are, you know, 200 plus, they've been the ones that have said that it just would want, um, you know, that they, they were curious about if it would be effective on their properties. Um, and then we get into the conversations and even with the 130, my spray rate is a, is slightly slower per acre, you know, acres per hour than what they're doing on average with the boom. It seems like most of them do right around 20 acres per hour. I'm a little less than that, but um, with two, I know I can manage two by my two by myself with the setup I've got. Um, I'm curious to see what the difference between the 40 and the uh, 30 is going to be. You know, when I get mine, get to uh, put it through its paces a little bit. If I can fly things faster and less times, um, you know, I'm going to have some pretty big, I'm going to surpass the speed of a boom right there. I mean, if I get two, then I've, you know, some of the numbers I was working with is I figured if I had two, I'd be running around basically 30 to 40 acres per hour pretty easily on my, on my place, just me by myself, which would be you know, way faster than what they're doing. So it, it absolutely is scalable. I mean, you could have fewer people out there spraying quicker and it's, it's going to pay for itself. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, Tyler, I really appreciate this. Uh, it's been really eye opening uh, for us working with you. Um, learning about cranberries, learning about drones, learning together. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, and I hope that, uh, hope many people follow in, in your, in your footsteps, um, and embrace new technology just like you've done. 